church, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, has sent me here. Uh, 14, 15 years ago, I was reading an amazing book about the history of preaching. It's an excellent book called The Company of the Preachers. It's a big 600-page book uh, with little biographies and analyses of men and women that the Lord has used. And I was reading about um, some of the great Scottish preachers, and there was a footnote. I, I forgot who it was that they were focusing on. Maybe Alexander White, uh, who was from Edinburgh. And I went to the footnote, and it said, at the current rate of decline in Scotland, and uh, there will hardly be a Christian church in the year 2034 or something. And just reading a footnote, just never been to Scotland, and it just hit my heart, and I thought, no, that cannot be. That cannot be. I refuse to accept that. Amen? So I, I prayed, Lord, I'm no one, but... If I could ever encourage the pastors and people in Scotland, oh God, you know, I'm available, but I know nothing. I don't know anyone in Scotland. So over the years since then, some people have visited. You know, someone will walk up to you at the end of a service and say, I pastor in Scotland. Can you come over next week? And I go, I know I can't come over next week. I don't know who you are. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out. Um, what to do, how to do it right in the, in the will of God. But then I met Rob Bell, who really has put together some, this has organized all this, and I thank God for the pastor here to host it. Can we just thank God for Rob Bell and the pastor here? So I appreciate it. So I'm here as kind of like, wow. And I was supposed to come with my wife, but she had a knee surgery, few months ago and her knee acted up on her and and I've been three days in London I was supposed to be with her and uh, so I was alone so that I could come here to Scotland and she reminded me last night she said Jim remember I'm 31 percent Scottish <laughs> and I just have fallen in love just this short time here with your country so uh, let me just tell you a little bit in very brief form about my journey and uh, how I uh, ended up being here and in the ministry. My, uh, I was born, I'm half Polish, half Ukrainian, and my father started drinking when I was uh, about 12 or 13, and he became a full-fledged alcoholic, lost his job. So I grew up in a very hellish house uh, because he got physical when he drank. So he was pounding on my mother, and I was too small to defend myself. So there was a lot of violence and just craziness. And yet they had drugged me to church as a kid, so my dad really had fallen away from the Lord. And uh, he continued drinking for 22 years. He never made it to my ma uh, wedding when I married my wife, Carol. He was on a bender and was out of it. So there was a lot of uh, dysfunction and pain. Um, so because my dad drank and the house was bad, um, I, I was out in the playgrounds and parks in New York City uh, playing all sports, but especially basketball, which I uh, became fairly proficient at. So I made all city uh, in New York City as a bas high school basketball player and then went to college on a basketball scholarship. So that was my life then, just because I didn't come home at night, I would practice until it was dark and just that was my whole world. Then I graduated college and worked in the business world, married my wife, who's a pastor's daughter, and uh, she's very gifted, much more than I am. She's won six Grammy Awards. You know what Grammys are here, right? Yeah. And she can't read or write music. She's never been trained. So the joke in our church is she doesn't know what she's doing. She just keeps doing it every Sunday. And we're all happy she's doing it. So um, 
in an odd way, God called me into the ministry, but although I wasn't trained in a seminary Bible school, and I ended up in downtown Brooklyn at a church kind of overseen by her father, but the church was sideways, uh, it had bad days and problems. So when Carol and I came, they were about to close it down, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, and uh, when we came, there were less. I just want to say this so that I want you to understand. I think I can understand anything and everything you could be going through. So when we came, there were less than like 15, 17 people on Sunday. And on a weeknight, there would be two people, sometimes five people. The first offering I collected there was $85 was the total tithes and offering. And although that was a while ago, that's still not much money. So I had to get a second job, and Carol got a job, because what did we know? We're just in the ministry, downtown Brooklyn, no crack yet, but a lot of heroin, a lot of alcoholism, homelessness, gangs. So here we were in the most depressing building you could imagine with broken pews. I was telling the pastor that, it was just, it was so depressing. I didn't want to go, and I was in charge, and that's not a good sign. Uh, and um, one, one Sunday, uh, these benches that we, pews that we inherited, it was so sad. They were, everything was just in poor condition. So while I was speaking one day, uh, three people were sitting on this pew, and the wood gave way and it cracked, you could hear it, and they all fell on the floor. And people thought it was a move of the Holy Spirit, and, and they were going, oh, praise God, praise God. And uh, so when I began, I've learned by mistakes, and, and you know, I have a vast library of books, because the books have been my teachers, uh, men, who are, men who have been passed away, a lot from the UK. Um, my sermons were so bad at the beginning, people were converting to other religions while I was <laughs> preaching. So when they all have red dots on their forehead at the end of your sermon, that's not a good sign. I can tell you that right now. But you, you do what's in front of you. As they say in New York City, it is what it is. I, it is what it is. It, that's where I was. So... Um, My goal became, obviously, something that I know your goal is. The hardest thing in the ministry is to see souls get saved. Three points in conclusion, making up sermons, stealing people from other churches. That's, the angels don't rejoice when you steal someone from another church. They rejoice when one person repents. Am I correct? So then how to do that? So I had grown up in and around church. And there's a lot of hyperbole, and there's a lot of, um, as they say in New York City, people just talking smack. Um, well, before Christ comes, there's going to be a great move of the Holy Spirit. You know that. But I, I learned that some of those people tooting that horn, they lived 20, 30 years in the ministry and never saw God do anything. But they lived in a kind of escapism of, yes, but before the Lord comes. Well, that's great, whatever that might be. But how about right here, right now with me? Also, people looking back. Well, remember the Great Awakening and remember the Welsh Revival and remember this time and that time. And that's great, too. Those have inspired me. I'm a little bit of a student of church history. That's great. But I mean, right now, right here in Brooklyn, what, God, what do I do? What do we do? Because if these promises are true, God's supposed to do and work through us so that Jesus is glorified. You'll bear much fruit so that my Father will be glorified, Jesus said. So no one would come to our church out of it being attractive. That was the last thought. No one would step in that place. But... Um, well, you know, you keep uh, working and learning and making mistakes, and God is blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. So we started to emphasize our prayer meeting on Tuesday nights, uh, which are now attended by more than 1,000 people. 
and every Tuesday, and more before the, the pandemic. The pandemic is the pandemic that's changed everything. But uh, we moved out of that building into another building, uh, which we rented, a hall that had about 400 seats. And then we went to a theater, which we renovated, and that seated about 1,200 people or so. And we increased meetings. We sent out people to start other churches in the New York City area and elsewhere. But people kept getting saved, and the building was filling up, so we went from two services to three services, and then we saw children being turned away from our kids program. So I said to the pastors, look, we've been here like, uh, let's see, that would be almost 20 years. Uh, so God, we can't go on like this. We can't see people turned away. So we made, we fasted for a week and prayed and we said, well, God, what are you saying? So we decided to move and look for another building, but you have to find something massive. And I don't know how it is here in Scotland, but I think it would be the same in a city like this. No one in New York City buys land and bills. There, there's no land to buy. And it's exorbitant, the cost of that. So you're renovating usually some building that was something else. At least that's what we have specialized in. We find theaters and we turn them into churches. And uh, I thought it would take a year or 18 months. I was totally naive. And uh, it took uh, six years to find the building and, and buy it. And it was a theater built in 1918 at the end of World War I in downtown Brooklyn, seated 4,100 people when it was built, largest theater in North America. And now because of code and sound and uh, soundboard, it seats 3,500 people. And we got it. But it took six years to get there, and we had to add another service. So for six years, I did four services every Sunday, 9, 12, 3, and 6, each service about two hours long. That's why I look so old. I'm 36 years old. <laughs> but those meetings just ate me up. They kill me. And, um, but you know what it is. Uh, you got to just trust in God. Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor, it's totally in vain. You can go through the motions, try hard, but unless God comes by his spirit and anoints his word being preached and loving the people, you can't build a church any other way. There's no new school, old school. There's only Bible school uh, of, of how to build the church of Jesus Christ. So that's where we are today, and um, God has been very good, and uh, my wife I just want to remind you, it's 31% Scottish. She kept telling me that last night. Someone, to, one of the pastors I met this morning said, Jim, you married well. You really picked a good one. 31% Scottish. So it's a joy to be here. So before I read the passage, uh, that I, it's very short, I want to read it to you. I recently did a series on the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And I had never done that uh, series like that. I rarely preach series, but uh, as I feel the Lord is leading me, I try to obey. So I really dug into that again, and I just want to say this to you, introduce what I'm going to read. Um, here's what I saw again afresh. If you study those seven letters, starting with Ephesus, ending with Laodicea, and all the other ones, you learn this that it's the risen Christ that John has a revelation of in the first chapter, in all his glory, overwhelming. John thinks he's going to die. He faints. And then Jesus is seen walking among the seven golden lampstands. And what are the lampstands? They're the churches. So that reminded me again, the most important thing happening on the earth is what's happening in your church and my church. Jesus is not trying to get in the UN building. He's not trying to get into Buckingham Palace or the White House in America. Those, those people, that's just playtime. That's nothing. They're going to change nothing. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. And the great interest of Jesus is your church. That's why he's seen, seen among the seven churches. The angels right now are watching what happens this Sunday in the churches. They're not trying to the stock market. 
European Union and all of that stuff. That's unimportant. That's not what God is interested in. He's interested in his people and what they're doing to represent him. So you got to remember this. You're doing the most important work of anyone here on planet Earth because we're building the kingdom. And everything else is going to pass away, but those who have found Christ, become part of his church, will dwell together forever with the Lord. The other thing that struck me again is that God is an emotional being. Jesus is an emotional, has an emotional side. What do I mean by that? Revelation shows that there are certain things that make him happy and certain things that make him sad. He's displeased with. Do I get an amen here or did you fall asleep already or what? So to the churches, there's two of them. There's only commendation to them, not one word. One, one church has nothing but negative said to it. Most of the churches or the majority would have yes and no. I know this. I know that. I see this. I see that. That's good. But I have this against you right? Or you've permitted that woman Jezebel to teach, or this or that. So certain things, like you and I, certain things make us happy, certain things make us sad, correct? Well, the Lord is the same way. So it would behoove us, like, what is the letter to your church? There's a letter to your church, I assure you. What's the letter to the Brooklyn Tabernacle? That's why we have to pray and wait before the Lord. Not how our peers think of our church. What does that matter? Or your denomination, which doesn't exist to God. There are no denominations that exist to God. He only has one body. Everybody say amen to that. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. There's only one. There's no Baptists and Charismatics or Assembly of God. There's nothing. That, those are... Those are flights of our imagination, and they're usually not healthy because it separates us rather than unites us. So what does he say about your church? Not what your associate pastor tells you or, or your denomination or your peers. What does Jesus think? Because remember, one of the letters is to a church. You have a name that you're alive, but I know you're dead. No, you be dead. You're dead. Oh, no, that can't be. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, and all these things are true. Positional, doctrinal truth uh, is important. But then there's what's happening on the ground. There's like what's really happening in your church and mine. How does the Lord look at it? Is he pleased? Is he not pleased? So some of the churches that displease him the most, there's nothing doctrinally that he corrects. That was startling to me as I started to ponder it. He doesn't say to every church like Laodicea, your doctrine is wrong, you're off on this, you're off on that. No, he says you're neither hot nor neither cold. You're lukewarm. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That language is strange to us today because how could the Lord who loves us, who died on the cross for us, say I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, and yet he says it. Amen? So I don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. I don't want to be that church. I want to be a church pleasing to the Lord. We want to be pastors pleasing. How many agree? Lift your hand up. All right. We're all together. This is what we want. So to build a church, to win souls, not to rob people from other churches, not to have church growth. That is really a bad phrase, I think. It's heard in America, I can assure you, because the aim is not winning souls. It's numbers. How do I get them back next week? Oh, if I preach this or preach that, they might not come back. I won't preach that. That is not a good way to run a railroad. That is not a good thing. Um, no, just get them back next week. Keep it, you know, Christianity light, like Pepsi light, Coke light. Keep it light, uh, L-I-T-E. But no, that's not. We, we want to see people get saved. Do you realize everyone that's in your church, everyone in your town where you are, a billion years from now, they're going to be somewhere? No, look at me. They're going to be somewhere. They're going to be in heaven with Jesus or in hell away from God. That's what the Bible says. I'm not making that stuff up. That's what Jesus said. That should put such a passion in us. Now, right now, just before I read, pray for me because Brooklyn has gone sideways uh, since the pandemic. Uh, there's no, they have new bail laws. 
so that people who are arrested never spend a night in jail. They're just released. So it's catch and release. A woman was just arrested and actually spent a night in jail. She had uh, done shoplifting 101 times. She had been arrested, stopped 101 times, but no bail. And they say, you come back in 90 days as if she's going to come back. She's not coming back. So, and this is for any kind of crime, short of just like murder or something, or you're beating someone to death on the street. So there, there's just, uh, um, the only time she was arrested was when a cop came to, a uh, police officer came to stop her. She shoved the police officer and that, that aggravated the situation. So they've em emptied a lot of the mental hospitals. So there's always been homeless, but now the homeless are not well in their mind. So they're getting very aggressive. So when they ask for money, they're not just saying, hey, could I hold some money for a coffee or something? They get aggressive and come up in your personal space and uh, pushing people off of the subway platforms. It's really uh, uh, the Wild West uh, right now in Brooklyn. But it is what it is. You have your problems here. I have my problems here. But Jesus is greater than all of our problems. Amen? And, uh, you know, Spurgeon said... Uh, when a, a, a jeweler shows his best diamonds, he lays them on black velvet to show them. Why? Because the contrast bec between the black velvet and the diamonds brings out the luster of the diamonds. And Spurgeon said, I think it's true, good point. Uh, when God does his best work, he does it in the darkest of times. He saves the worst of sinners like Saul of Tarsus. Why? So he can show how great his mercy is. Can we put our hands together and say amen to that? So, so it is what it is. And the Lord's called us in the ministry so that we can bear fruit. And we can have a church pleasing to him, bearing fruit. Seeing people get saved, seeing them discipled, and on with it, right? Right now, it's crazy because in our lobby, we have a police officer in uniform, in the lobby of our church, as thousands come into the two services that we have every Sunday, uh, because you don't know who will walk in with what weapon or just crazy. Um, many years ago, a guy pulled a gun on me uh, in the meeting while I was preaching and came up on the platform, walked right down the aisle. Security was, they were having tea and scones or something. They weren't watching <laughs> And uh, the guy walked right up on the platform with the gun drawn on me, 45, and had ammunition. It was loaded. But I had my eyes closed, and I was asking people, you know, to come to Jesus. I was half praying, half making a, a petition. And my wife was uh, sitting on the keyboard behind me at that time in that church building and just playing. And she yelled, Jim, Jim, because the guy now was walking across this large stage toward me and the people saw him but it was too late to do anything and I you know I'm, I'm asking people to come to Jesus meanwhile I'm on my way to Jesus I didn't know that and and suddenly as I'm preaching I hear this crash on on my on the pulpit it was wood the pulpit we had then and I looked down there's a gun I didn't go to seminary but even if I did there are no classes on what to do when they throw a gun on your pulpit and i look and here's this troubled man a jewish guy who wasn't his wires weren't connected and um someone had messed with his woman and he had gotten a gun and was on his way to take the guy out and somehow by the providence of god grace of god he came in our building heard this message about the love of god and in his tormented mind, he got convicted. You got to give up that gun. Don't keep that gun. But he was out of it. So all he knew was, I'll just go up and give the gun to the preacher. That sounds like a good idea. So, but it was drawn on me. And um, anyway, I, I chased after him. He was walking off. And I didn't, I was just reacting. And I went, no, wait, wait, wait. And he's going off tormented and just let out a scream. Oh, Jesus, help me. And fell halfway down the aisle. And then security came uh, a little late, a little late. Uh, and then they were going to beat him to death. So I had to tell them, no, 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 leave him be. Leave, something, something's happening here. 
So can you imagine a first time visitor in our church that day? Oh, you visited the Brooklyn Tabernacle. How was the meeting? Oh, it was great. A guy came with a gun drawn on the minister. You know how God works everything for good, though? I went back, not knowing, obviously, I didn't know what to do. And I saw him praying, and you could feel the spirit stirring something in the building. And I took the gun. I hate guns. But I take, took it, not knowing it was loaded, and I held it up. And I said, look at what the love of God can make you give up. That's all I thought to say. Suddenly, they started running to the altars. I think we baptized 14 people just from that meeting. Just running because, you know, when God comes, it gets really amazing. Amen? So there's a model church in, in, that has always stood out to me. And I'm just going to read to you from just look at me, if you, if you don't mind, and 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the, the church in Thessalonica, to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We always thank God for all of you, continually mentioning you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. They not only had faith mental, they had heart faith that produced work. Faith without works is dead. This church was active and, and bearing fruit. Um, and your labor prompted by love. Why did they labor for Christ? Because they were filled with love. If our hearts aren't filled with love, we're not going to do it. We're only going to be living with, oh, I'm supposed to do this. But that's not how the, wor the work of the Lord is done. Uh, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 4, listen. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how our gospel came to you, not in word only. We weren't communicators. We weren't glib in our speech. We weren't oratorical geniuses. Our gospel came in not word only. We weren't talkers. It came with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Those people got converted, the rest of the chapter says, and they turned from idols to serve the living God. And he said their conversion was so dramatic, this church in Thessalonica, that... The news of their faith had gone out everywhere, Paul said. We, can't, we don't even have to tell people about you. They already know about you, your faith. You see, the way they talk about churches then, we've lost that. They always discuss their faith and love. We talk numbers, building size, and budget. And that's not what the church is about. We want to see men and women filled with faith, amen? And love that only Jesus can produce. So... And he says just that you became a model to all the churches. Now, Thessalonica <clears throat> was visited by Paul after he got thrown in the slammer in prison in Philippi. You remember, he was led by the Spirit not to go to where he wanted to go in Asia, Turkey, but he ended up going to Greece because he had a Macedonian uh, vision there. So... He goes to Philippi, he has problems like he has everywhere, and, um, and he stays there for a while, starts a church, then has to get out of town. He goes to Thessalonica, and it says that for three Sabbaths, he reasoned in the synagogue, which is where he started. And then people came against him, provoked uh, trouble, and he had to leave. The commentators are not sure how long he stayed in Thessalonica. Some think as little as a month. Others say it couldn't be more, <clears throat> excuse me, than three months. But he wasn't there for two years. Or, or 18 months like Corinth, three years like in Ephesus. He was there a matter of, it seems, weeks or at the most a month. How do you do that? How do you have a church when you have no New Testaments to hand out? I like this, this little booklet here, this thing of John. That, that's very nice. He didn't have that. He had no PowerPoint. Had no microphone, no public building to meet in. He had no money. The Roman government was against him. They thought people who called Christ Lord was against emperor worship, which they were. 
They got persecuted because they wouldn't bow to Caesar. The Jewish religious establishment was against them. Had no building, no money, no Christian heritage, no history, no nada, nothing. And yet he's saying, oh, everyone talks about what God did. And you became a model. How did he do that? Wouldn't you want to be a fly on the wall and try to figure out how did he build a church? And in America, I can't speak, you, you forgive me, I can't refer to Scotland because I know nothing about Scotland or very little, except that I know it's a difficult time right now for the, the kingdom being built here. But God can overcome that. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. I want to see us all get closer to the Lord. Amen? And be used by God. So without all the things that we just take for granted, he was building a church with no complaints. Like in America, they go, they've taken prayer out of schools. Worse, there's no prayer in the churches. Forget in schools. Why, why, you think they had prayer in the schools in the Roman Empire? That's ridiculous. But we're complainers, and we want to be diversionary. We want to divert away maybe from our own lack and our inefficiency. So we talk about, oh, the culture is so hard. They had a Caesar who was worshipped as God. And some of them, Caligula and Nero in the New Testament era, you don't want to even know how they lived and what they did. But yet, never a complaint. It was like, no, let's get it on. No, let's get it on. I'll preach the gospel. You'll see what Jesus will do. So let's get rid of all excuses. It's hard in Scotland. It's hard in Brooklyn. It was the pandemic. Whatever. God is greater than all of those things. Amen? So, but here's the key. My, our gospel came to you not in word only. This is, let's focus on that for ourselves. Our gospel came to you in, not in word only, but in power in the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. That's all I want you to think about as we will go to prayer here in a little while. It is true, by the way, that both Testaments say, my house shall be called a house of, not preaching, not singing. Those are all important. House of prayer. Why? Because in prayer, God gives us what we need. You have not because you ask not. You don't want that put on your tombstone. They had not because they asked not. Forget the purposes of God and eternal decrees. No, you didn't have it because you didn't ask. I would have given it to you. The church at Laodicea didn't have to be lukewarm. He was at the door knocking. The question is, did they get off their back ends and open the door? If you open the door, he's going to come in and eat and fellowship, and then there'll be fruit and blessing. But the question is, we're left hanging at the end of chapter 3 of Revelation. Did they get up and let him in? Remember, he's standing at the door knocking. If anyone will get up and open the door, I'll come in. Did they? We don't know. If they didn't, gone. Flushed out of his mouth. If they did open the door, things will turn around. Same with us today. Nothing, no situation's too hard for Jesus. So... Our gospel. Why would he say that? Why didn't he say the gospel came to you not in word only? He says our gospel. Why do he say that? Because there were already many gospels going around. Like in America. Again, I can forgive my reference to the country I live in. There's the black gospel. There's white gospel. There's conservative gospel. Republican gospel. Democratic gospel. Cultural gospel, prosperity gospel. Everyone should be driving a Mercedes. There's so many gospels going around that, that, that it, it makes your head get, your hair go on fire. There's just many gospels. Already it was happening then. He, remember the church in Corinthians, second letter? He said, you received the gospel, but not the one I gave you. No, 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 no. These, these fake guys came in after me. They gave you another gospel. And, oh, yeah, you're talking about Jesus, but not the Jesus I told you about. No, 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 no. They gave you another Jesus. And this is the most startling one. You've received the Spirit, but not the Holy Spirit. What did that mean? What did that look like? So he wants to now isolate and point out to them 
There's only one true gospel, and I didn't receive it from men, he says in Galatians. I received it from Jesus himself. So I, I want to give you all an assignment. I'm no professor or teacher, but I, I, I'll give you a noteworthy assignment. I'm doing it all the time, have done it in the past. I suggest you do it. The gospel that was Paul's, the message, the good news, was the one in Romans 1 where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. That gospel, his gospel has power. Maybe what you heard growing up isn't the gospel. Could you have the humility to consider that? I don't want to get up in your grill and, and be overly uh, confrontational, but uh, I know, I, for example, I grew up uh, in a, uh, a small church that my parents drugged me to when I was little, and they were very strict and a lot of rules about uh, dress and whatever and all of that, but they wouldn't want a black person within 100 yards of that church. No. No, no, no. They were racist from the, the, from the get-go. So should I follow the tradition? You think my wife and I would be in downtown Brooklyn? I'll show you a video during the morning of her choir singing. Would you like to see her choir sing just one song? I'll, I'll show you later. We had a, she, she wrote this song called Pray. It's very powerful. She woke up in the middle of the night singing it. I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> she just bolted up from her pillow and started singing. And I went, what, what, what happened? What happened? And she says, no, I got a song from God. And she ran in and started playing it and recording it. Otherwise, she could lose it. So what we grew up around and the messages we heard might have been diluted or had something added to it. I'm being respectful now, but I do want to challenge you. I love you. I encourage you. I want to encourage you. But I have to challenge you. Because you can be sincere and work hard, but if you're not preaching the gospel Paul gave... You're going nowhere fast. You're on a treadmill. You're a treadmill. So here's the assignment. Why don't you read every sermon carefully of the gospel presentation in the book of Acts? Go to Acts 2 and read Peter's sermon. No, parse it. Go sentence by sentence. What's the subject? What's the verb? What's the object? What did he say? I think it was a good sermon. It was simple, but 3,000 got saved. That's not bad. For a guy who just denied the Lord less than 60 days earlier, not a bad sermon. Amen? So analyze every sentence. Is that what you're preaching? Oh, no, Pastor. I grew up, Pastor Jim. I grew up in. I don't care how you grew up. That's irrelevant to me. And I don't care how I grew up. I want to know what the book says. I want to know what that sermon was. Uh, Peter, again, in Acts 3, when uh, the, uh, the lame man is healed at the temple gate. Then Acts 10, when he goes to Cornelius' house. Then Acts 13, on Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas, uh, when he's in Antioch in Pisidia and he preaches uh, in the synagogue. What, what did he say? What didn't he say? What did he say? And what are we saying? Have we added something? Listen, my wife makes a beautiful, uh, even though she's not Italian, She's Scottish. She reminded me of that. She, she makes a wonderful tomato sauce for spaghetti. Okay, she got this recipe, or she, she does it by feel, like she plays. She can't read or write music, so she just, she cooks like that, just whatever she feels. <laughs> but this one she learned from a great Italian cook. Now, if you take away the onion or whatever she put, just take away one thing. It's not the same sauce. No, no, it's not the same. No, it's red. It's, no, it's not the same. Won't taste the same. If you add something, okay? You, 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 you know, you, you throw in uh, some uh, um, apples or whatever and mix it all up. No, no, that's not the same sauce. That's how it is with the gospel. Listen, God doesn't need creative thought from any of us. Have you noticed that he's God? Come on, can we put our hands together and say amen? God has given us the message that has power. But are we preaching it? No, in America, don't mention sin. People get uncomfortable. 
They don't want to be told they have to change. So we'll just avoid that so they can keep coming. But then what are you building? So all the polls now in America show that most people go to church on Sunday don't live different than the people in the world. They're sleeping around. They're doing whatever. Uh, um, so we have to not add. We can't subtract. You can't take away repentance. You can't add something else. How about this? We, again, I, I can only do America. Uh, come up to the front at the end of the meeting and join the church. That is nowhere found in the Bible. Nowhere. You show me one place where Peter, James, John, or Paul ever said at the end, here's the secret. Come and join my church. No. A lot of that's ego. You don't have to say amen. I know it is ego. We want to have the biggest church. Or look, look what, look what we have. But that's not the gospel. Join the church. No, just confess the word and you'll drive a bigger car and have more money. That is not. Show me one place that they preach that. There's no, even in a way, charismatic gospel. Because if you study the gospel message, they're preaching about Jesus, who he is, what he did, the cross, the resurrection. Now, the gifts of the Spirit, that's a very interesting discussion to have. And you can study that from 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and other places. But that's not part of the gospel presentation. No, they did not preach that. Once you become a believer, now you can grow and hopefully grow in grace and seek the best gifts, the most edifying ones. But that's not the gospel. Not join our church, not five-point Calvinism, not Wesley Arminianism. That is not found in the gospel. Read the words. Don't, don't believe me. Read what Peter said. Read what Paul preached. Read how simple it is. And in leaving that simplicity, we've diluted the power of the gospel. So in America, again, forgive me the reference, churches are turnstiles. People come. They stay for two, three weeks. Then whatever happened to that lady? Oh, she's gone now. It's like a mall. People are just shopping around. And, but real conversions, water baptisms, people's lives changed. Oh, my goodness. That's what we want. That's all my wife and I live for, to see somebody changed. I'm going to show you a video later about one of the most dramatic changes I ever saw in anyone's life from some years ago. A guy who went from making $3,000 a day as one of the top hairstylists and makeup artists in the fashion industry to living on the street for years, just shooting dope all day long and became hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. And there's one picture of him you'll see. It's almost subhuman. And God turned him around. With the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our gospel. What gospel are we preaching? He doesn't need creative thought. May I add this? He doesn't need a vision that, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the vision that you have for the Brooklyn Tabernacle? I don't have a vision. It's not my church. I, I read somewhere, Jesus said, I'm going to, upon this rock, I'll build my church. How would I have a vision? How presumptuous is that? Have a vision for his church. It's not my church. Carol and I don't run the Brooklyn Tabernacle. The Holy Spirit is supposed to run the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And the church is belonging to Jesus. So all this stuff, I, I meet people in America who have a vision for their church. And then I learn later someone came and said, you know, there's hardly any prayer in our church. And my house shall be called a house of prayer and all that. And the pastors have told them, this is glibly, easily said, oh, that's not part of my vision for the church. Well, wait, wait a minute, time out. Time out. I just was thinking, in football games here, there are no timeouts, are there? You have to keep playing all the way to the end. That's hard. By the way, I have a little bone to pick with all of you. I'm in London on Monday night, Tuesday night, and I'm all getting ready to come to Scotland, and I hear, watch tonight, the guy says, England's playing soccer, uh, uh, England is playing uh, Scotland in a, in a, they say friendly, but nothing's friendly between England. <laughs> Am I correct? I, I learned that from my friend Rob. So I'm all, I, I, I wanted, uh, it's blue is your color, right? Yeah. I wanted, I, I got into it. I turned it on. I'm not a big football fan, but I watched it. I got disgusted by that game. I was so depressed. We lost three to one, didn't we? Oh, look, she's crying already when I just said it. No, and I, here I was into it for the first time rooting for Scotland. But, we, through Jesus Christ, 
we can build his church his way. His way. Hey, it's not your church. Did you die on a cross? Did you resurrect? So then, you know, don't take your tell so serious. That's corporate America speaking. What's your vision for your corporation? We're not supposed to have a vision opposite or different than the vision of the New Testament. Preach the gospel. Disciple the people. Call on God. Live in joy. Live lives wanting to be more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Amen? So our gospel came not in word only. Our gospel. His. God make it ours. Not in word only, but in power. Now, whenever you see power, you got to know it's the Holy Spirit. So here's, as Andrew Bonar said from Scotland, all merit is in the Son. All power is in the Spirit. We, we, we ex approach God through Christ and what he did on the cross. But now Jesus promised in Acts 1, power. So he said, my preaching was powerful. Holy Spirit in the middle is the power and the conviction. My, it didn't come in word only. I wasn't dazzling you with footsteps, with, with uh, uh, cleverness. We're dying from cleverness in America. We're dying from cleverness. The last thing we need is more cleverness. We need power. We need people leaving saying, surely God is in the midst of those people. I understand everything, but whoa, God's in that place. How many want that? Do you want that? Amen? So if we preach the gospel and we trust in the Holy Spirit, we'll have power when we speak. What does that power look like? There's no hint that Paul at any time, at any moment, could call sick people forward and just heal them uh, at request. There's no hint of that. God heals. God can do anything. But he didn't just stop the meeting every seven minutes and open blind eyes and, and all of that. But his preaching had power. What does that mean? The words had weight. It didn't put people to sleep. It jarred them that they either going to listen or they'll get out of the building. But I'd rather have them either listen and get saved or get out of the building. Right? I've had people walk out of the building when I'm preaching and shake their fist at me because I preached something which brought conviction on them. And, and I look at them and it hurts me. I'm a human like you. But I'd rather have people either come to Jesus or get out of there but just to sit and never be changed week after week, month after month, that's a nightmare. That's a nightmare. So he said it came with power. Remember what it said about Samuel? None of his words fell to the ground. They had weight. They weren't just blah, 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 just talking, flapping your lips. And it could be doctrinally correct, but it has all the weight of a feather. So he was anointed when he spoke. We need the true gospel, but the gospel has to be preached with power sent down from heaven. The, the message, the sermon has to do with the preacher. Otherwise, we could just play tapes of great sermons from great preachers in the past. It won't have the same effect. Truth coming through personality is a good definition of preaching. And that truth has to come anointed by the Holy Spirit. So it gets into the people's hearts. And all the lies that Satan has put around there, it can break through that darkness and get in there. And they were pricked in their hearts on the day of Pentecost. They were pierced. And they said, what must we do? Why? Read Peter's sermon. Is it a masterpiece? No. Someone in first year in Bible school could do that sermon. It wasn't how clever he was. It was the weight, the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not feeling a lot of love up here. Are you agreeing with me or what? So, so we need that. That doesn't mean screaming. It doesn't mean getting, emo not emotionalism, not the organ playing a certain kind of music. No, that, that's a waste of time. Emotionalism is the last thing we need. Or cultural church, cultural Pentecostalism, or cultural anything. I don't want to be anything but a New Testament Christian. Anything in the New Testament, I want to experience it. All in favor say amen. amen. If, and if it's not in the Bible, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to touch it. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 is not wise to go beyond what's written. So he said, my preaching wasn't in word only, but with power. Can, should we not ask God today 
for more power? Aren't you dissatisfied with your preaching? I'm dissatisfied with mine. I always have been. I have never listened to one tape or saw one video of me preaching ever in my life. Because when I just looked at one at the beginning, when I saw it, I went, eh, I could do better than, oh, God, help me. That's the truth is God is listening to me. I, I want to speak with power, not with oratory and have people, whoa, wasn't that clever how he made us laugh and he, then he rhymed everything. I don't want that. <laughs> Why you rhyme things here sometimes? Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. I just said that. Um, and, you know, like, like sermons are like a, a creation of, like a masterpiece of some kind. No, read the sermons in the New Testament. What do you think God put them in the book of Acts for? That we could read them and listen and learn. So that power brings conviction of sin. That power lets you be natural. The Holy Spirit will never use you if you're imitating someone. Listen to me. The world doesn't need an echo. It needs a voice. You don't want to echo people or change your personality. That has always bothered me since I was growing up. Uh, I would, my, my best friend was the pastor's son, Carol's uh, brother, and we would play basketball together. And I would end up at the house sometime. And then I would meet some of the visiting preachers who were there for lunch or dinner, and I'd be sitting at the table. I was 14, 15, 16 years old. And that really used to stun me. Because I would meet them. They were regular people. Hey, Jim, what's up? This, that, the other thing. And then they would get in the pulpit on Sunday. And I thought, well, who is that? <laughs> well, praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord is here. Uh, so what is that? I just ate with that dude. He wasn't talking like that. You go to the restaurant. You don't hear them say, hey, waiter, I want a hamburger. Praise God. <laughs> But why that's serious is that grieves the Holy Spirit. The moment you act, the Holy Spirit goes, bye. You're on your own now. You're totally on your own. I don't anoint actors. You want, uh, you want actors? Go to Broadway. Not in the church. We're supposed to appeal to people's conscience and be natural. That was very hard for me when I first started. So maybe some of you I can encourage. So I started, and I didn't know how to be a minister. I told you how when I preached, I fell asleep, not just the congregation. <laughs> we all had a little rest. So I was, after about six, seven weeks, I was driving home, and I said to my wife, who had more experience, pastor's daughter, I said, uh, how, how, am I, how am I doing? And she said, do you really want to know? Now, whenever your wife says, do you really want to know, fasten your seatbelt. I said, yeah. She said, terrible. I said, why? She said, that's not you. See, I didn't believe that God could use me speaking conversationally. This is all I can do. What you see is what you get. So I was trying to channel pastors I had heard growing up. And many times when I worship the Lord or the God touches me, I cry like a baby still to this day. I didn't want to cry in front of the people. They'd call the police and get a mental institution to uh, make a bed for me. So I was so self-conscious. I was just trying to get through and act ministerial. Please, I plead with you in the name of Christ. Don't be ministerial. Be who you are. Be who you are. Talk the way you talk. No two snowflakes are the same. Why would two ministers be the same? And many of us are unconsciously uh, uh, imitating, unconsciously, what we saw growing up. Don't do that. God has something better for you. Thank God for how we grew up if we had good influence. Thank God for people who have influenced us. But you can't imitate them. Now you're an echo. You're not a voice. You're imitating someone. So... The Holy Spirit makes for spontaneity. I'm not, I'm not purporting, proposing this for anyone, but I haven't preached with notes in 17 years. And what's helped me, if I could just say this now, Carol was away in Nashville doing a, a project with the Nashville String Machine. It's an orchestra that was being laid on top of her recording. I was all alone, and I was so tired. 
I was running around like a chicken without its head. I didn't have the wisdom of a, of a squirrel. And run down, saying yes to invitations and just trying to help people. But sometimes God's answer to someone is, no, I can't do that. But I didn't discern that so well then. So anyway, I'm just run down. I don't go into the office that day. They needed me, but I just sat in a chair up in this house we lived in. Now we live in an apartment that we rent, but we had a house then. And I sat in a chair with a large print NIV about quarter to 10 in the morning. We needed $1.2 million. They had just called me within four days because we were in the middle of that building project I told you about. And uh, I was going to go in the office. And I, I know the Lord spoke to me and said, where are you going? Well, I'm going in the office because, you know, like I'm a pastor. Maybe I should go to the office. No, just be with me. So I called back, said, I'm not coming. Well, how are we going to get that money, pastor? I said, I don't know. I don't know anyone has 1.2. So... I spent the whole day alone in that little attic room with the Lord. Man, we need to be with the Lord more. You want your preaching to come with power? You have to be with the Lord. You want to be led what to preach on? You got to be with the Lord. If you're too busy to be with the Lord, you're too busy. Change your schedule. I have to remind myself that all the time. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the spirit of God, this is just the way it works. Don't think you'll make a new way. No one's ever made a new way. There's only this way. Be alone with Jesus and let him just let those rivers come, rivers of living water. About halfway through the day, I had so little faith. I was so worn out. I, I couldn't even pray. I told the Lord, I can't pray. So I just read the word. That's a good practice, by the way. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. You read that word, faith stirred up, and you can pray more effectively. Amen? So halfway through the day, I just, the Lord came in that little room, God knows, listening to me now, that I out loud said, what is this? Because he was baptizing me with a peace that I had never, ever experienced. You know, there's depths of these things. People are looking for novelties and this, and God is filling teeth, and angels have left feathers in the service, and all these other crazy things, howling like wolves and whatnot. That won't help you win souls. So, um, I said, oh, Lord, he, he helped me so much. Has he ever done that for you? Just revive. How many have ever been at the end? You, didn't, you couldn't do it anymore. Oh, you're lying, most of you. You didn't lift your hand. I know that about you. Of course, we've all been there. We're just embarrassed to say it. So about halfway through the day, Pastor, I felt the Lord say, don't preach with notes anymore. I thought that, that must be Satan. <laughs> Give up my notes? And I couldn't shake it. I said, but nothing wrong with notes. Not, absolutely nothing wrong. I preach all my life with notes. But you know what? On this topic of preaching, um, I had backup verses because I learned from a lot of the Puritans and all the books and I'd studied and read. So when I made a point, I wanted to back it up with scripture. But those scriptures weren't necessarily in my heart. They were just in my head, like making a legal case, but not in, in Spanish, in mi corazón. So, but what if I got lost? What if I lost my track, my train of thought? You know, notes, you can go to them. No, just do that. I said, Lord, I'll, I'll try if this way, but you have to help me. And I was nervous at first. But you know, it's helped me two ways that I leave with you. It's been more for me personally, more than two. But here's two things. By not depending on notes so much, I have to spend more time with the Lord. Because all I can give is what's in my heart. 
because my head can, can't take, you know, so much. I make less points. Not with you here. I'm, well, even here, I'm making not that many points. But you ever hear a guy preach, and he's preaching about nine different things all at once. Jesus is coming again. At a moment, the sound of the trumpet will come. He's coming from heaven. Did you know Lucifer was once in heaven? He was a worship leader, but he became Satan. And he was cast out of heaven. And now demons are around, but in the name of Jesus, we have authority over demons. But remember, even if you can cast out demons, if you don't have love... It's nothing. You're a sounding gong, a clanging cymbal or cymbal, yeah. And you've heard sermons like that, all correct, all biblically correct, but what's the point? People can't feel about nine different points. When you hear a preacher preaching and he goes, point 11, go home, it's, it's over. <laughs> it's over. No, the sermon is over. Who, the heart wasn't made to take in all those things and feel deeply. And I, I'm where there's a lot of uh, learning disabilities, ADD. You have that here? It's everywhere. So why preach if people aren't understanding what you're saying? I'm ministering now to a guy who lives in a shelter four doors down from the back door of my building. His name is Alfonso. And uh, Carol and I were just talking about him as I noticed him. He leans against the building wearing a, a hat when it's 90 degrees, a hat with flaps, a winter hat, and a winter coat. He's just something not right in his mind. And when I talked to her about him, about to Carol, she said, yeah, I'm a little leery. I said, I don't think he's violent, but how did he get that way? African-American guy, about 48 years old. The next Sunday, as God is listening, he's right there in the front. I make an invitation. He's this close. And I look, wait a minute, that's the guy. That's the guy was just talking about. So now we're, we're working with him and we got him clothes and we're analyzing his, his, uh, his situation. But he needs something from the Lord that I can provide inside and in his mind. Am I correct? So I make, how many points could he take in? I mean, really. So I make less points. I have to spend more time with the Lord. And that has helped me greatly. And for those of you who might be saying, well, that sounds like fanaticism, I would like you to just check out the book of Acts. There's no sermon recorded that the minister knew that he would even preach that day. Peter, Acts 2, Peter, Acts 3, Paul in the synagogue, Peter in Cornelius' house. Notes. They didn't even know they would preach. Nothing against notes. But I think Jesus said somewhere, when you're called before kings and judges, don't give any thought to what you'll say because your Father, the Holy Spirit, will speak right through you. One sentence said from your heart, anointed by the Spirit, has more power than three points that you make that only reach the mind. Can we put our hands together and just say amen to that? So, lastly, didn't come in word only, but it came in power. It came in power, the Holy Spirit, and in deep conviction. And what's odd there is the structure of the Greek in that sentence is not conviction on the hearers, although that will happen, but it's on the speaker. My gospel came to you through my preaching, was, which was with power, the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Unless God has dealt with us, and that what we're preaching is bursting out of our hearts. The people will know in one minute if it's three points in a conclusion, a sermon, or if it's something that God has made a lie. How can I preach about love if God hasn't dealt with me about my lack of love? How can I preach about faith unless God is dealing with me about trusting him more? So I want to tell all you precious leaders from Scotland, the best is yet to come. The water was turned into wine, and the wine at the end that Jesus made, they went, whoa, you brought the cheap stuff out first, and then you saved the best for last. So the best days of your church, the best days of your ministry are still going to happen. But we got to give ourselves to God right now and say, God, no, 
I'm drawing a line. I'm not, I'm not preaching anymore the way I have in the past. Has God blessed your sermons? I'm happy for you, but he, you can do better. Has God been blessing your church? Praise God. He's blessed our church, but there's more. There's something better. And I don't care how dark it is in your area or how ungodly the people are. The gospel preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's just close our eyes. Our sister would just go to that keyboard, please. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together love, all together world, all together one. I have a better song for this moment. Just don't play it yet. I need the oh, I need the. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to. Lift your hands with me and sing. I need. The oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless. I With your eyes closed, we're going to sing that again. Sister, you find whatever key you could play that in. And um, if you're a pastor, you're a preacher, and uh, the Lord has touched your heart while I'm reading from the Scripture, and you are hungry for God to do a new thing in your preaching, a new power, a new dimension of the Holy Spirit's help, and with deep conviction, where God so works in you that those who listen will know Oh, my goodness, I'm hearing the word of the Lord. If you're here and just hungry for that, just get up out of your seat and come on around me here in the front. Come on, just get out of your seat and come, and we'll pray together. Just come. Anybody, teacher. I need the oh I need the come close every hour I need oh bless me now my Let's lift our hands again like we did to the Lord. Come on. I need the oh, I need the every hour. Oh, bless me now. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We want to build your kingdom, not ours. Unto Jesus be all the praise and honor and glory. Not a church name, denomination, pastor's name. Let Jesus be praised. Let Jesus be praised. 
Let Jesus Christ be praised. Change our preaching. Change our leadership. More of you, less of us. Let our words be that of the good news that you put in the Bible, Lord. Help us not to go down some other trail and preach something other than Jesus and him crucified. Let it be good news. Let us not badger the people, but create hope and faith in them, Lord. Forgive us for sermons that were not really prepared in your presence, Lord, just to get through another Sunday. Forgive us, Lord. Put your word in, in our mouths. Anoint us so that people will feel the weight of our words, the truth that we speak in Jesus' name. Let our words and proclamation of Jesus push back evil forces in Scotland. Push them back, Lord, in the name of Jesus. This darkness is not too heavy and strong, Lord, that you can't shine your bright light in, Lord. Every city, every hamlet, every town, Lord. We're asking for you to do a new thing, a great thing, Lord. Thank you for the blessings of yesterday, but we want more, Lord. We want more. More, Lord. I need more of you, Lord. In New York, we need, I need more, Lord. All over Scotland, we need more, Lord. Give us a humble spirit so that we can be teachable. Help us not to think we know everything because... We've been in the ministry for a while. Make us like children, teachable, moldable. Let our gospel come not in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You did it for Paul, do it for us. We don't care about statistics and and the negatives. All we know is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let his name always be praised. If everybody could, in the building could stand, thank you. Well, our sister just plays. I want you to do me a favor. Just, I'll tell you when to stop. I want every brother in the room to turn to the nearest brother, join hands facing each other, and begin to pray out loud over one another. Pray at the same time. I want every sister to find the nearest sister. Face her. Come on, face her. Join hands and pray one for another. Come on, pray. Pray out loud. Pray. Pray. When you call upon me, I will answer, God says. <laughs>